So here we are with the Song of Songs, and we're in session two. And uh, this is, uh, you know, no discussion of personal lovemaking should miss an allusion to the ultimate opera, written by none other than Solomon himself. And uh, as Israel's third king, he ruled from 971 to about 931 B.C. And he was perhaps more gifted in literary skill than any other king of Israel, for he wrote over 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs, according to 1 Kings 4. Of the more than 1,000 songs he wrote, only this one was designed by God to be included in the Holy Scriptures. And so that should give us pause. And Jesus endorsed the Scripture, said the Scripture can't be broken. So this is included in that sweeping endorsement. So we need to understand that as we go forward here. Now it is outlined in five love poems, typically called idols. And uh, each one of these consists of a few reflections. And so it's in two basic parts. Part one is courtship and marriage. And part two will be the, uh, the uh, sexual adjustments after marriage. Very practical book, a surprisingly practical book, once you get used to the peculiar idioms that they used at that time. The first idol is the wedding day, and it consists of three reflections. And uh, the second idol is the courtship period, uh, and then the third one, making up the first idol, uh, is the marital union in, in broad terms. And uh, so... Following that, there will be a fourth idol with sex, dealing with sexual problems, and the fifth idol will wrap it up with the return to Galilee. What's interesting is, as part of the third idol, we have the consummation of the marriage in uh, chapter 4, verse 15 and following. What's interesting about that is that turns out to be in the exact center of the piece. There's 111 lines prior to this consummation, and there's 111 lines after. Not a big deal, except it demonstrates to us that this is designed. And one of the discoveries we each need to make for ourselves about the Bible is that every detail in the Bible is there by deliberate design. Every number, every place name, uh, uh, many of the puns and so forth. Uh, even the structures that lie underneath the text itself. Evidence is skillful design. And uh, once you discover that for yourself, you're confronted with a second discovery, and that is that the origin of that message had to occur from outside our time domain because it writes history before it happens in such precision that it, you can't ascribe it to chance. So here, even in this opera, in this collection of love poems about marriage, we discover it's very carefully designed. And uh, so now uh, the wedding day was the first idol, and we took that in the previous session. In this session, we're going to deal with the next two idols, which will include the consummation of the marriage, the peak, if you will, of the whole piece. So the uh, first idol we took last time, and this time we're going to focus on the next two idols. And the idol, uh, the second idol consists of two reflections. And so let's just jump in. We are in Song of Songs, uh, Chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. And uh, this seems to reflect springtime in the Galilee, where her lover paid her a visit with the eagerness of a gazelle. And uh, as Solomon approached his beloved's home, she excitedly described him as coming as a gazelle or a young stag. And... Uh, this emphasized his attractive appearance, of course, and his strength and his agility. So these are superlatives and, and, and a lot of fun. He approached the wall around her parents' home and then peered through the lattice. He was anxious to see her, is the flavor of what's coming here. She says, my beloved is like a roe or a gazelle or a young heart or a stag. Behold, he standeth behind our wall and looketh forth at, or let's say through, the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Now what is a gazelle? Most of us probably haven't encountered a gazelle. It looks like a deer, runs very swiftly, and is very graceful. 
And in this book, it will be mentioned seven times. It was considered a symbol of virility and is a most complimentary term here. And uh, the wall refers to the house itself, uh, uh, rather uh, the outer wall surrounding the house, which would require a different Hebrew word. It would seem that he is looking through the window is the way we should visualize this, I believe. And uh, so, looking, look forth. That word in Hebrew implies a fixation for reflection and meditation. In other words, it's an intensive term, if you will. Showing himself through the lattice. In other words, he's peering. You can see him with a twinkle in his eye. Uh, he is, as we might say, feasting his eyes. Now, most guys, I think, in today's world would probably be more like a bull in a china shop. Biblical standards for masculinity always emphasize strength and beauty dwelling together in the same body. That may surprise you. Men need to be romantic is the, uh, is the undertone here. And I'll ask you the question, are you a gazelle type or are you a gorilla? We tend to espouse perhaps different models than they did back then. Moving on, verse 10. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He's come north, up to the Galilee, after a long winter. He seems to desire her and to defer his business. He's probably up there on a business trip. He owned the property that her family managed. But he, uh, he's on a business trip, and yet he's departing here for some personal uh, attention. So Solomon, her lover, asked his darling to go for a walk in the countryside. Come away, he says. At the beginning and the end of his invitation, he said, come with me. In, uh, in uh, both here in verse 13, and, and he will echo that same thing in chapter 8 of this piece. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing of birds has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The word turtle in the King James is a little misleading. The term actually refers to a turtle dove, a, a, a bird. It's not so much a, a singing bird. It's a migratory bird, which implies a bird of passage. It signals, in effect, that spring has arrived. That's the whole flavor that they're painting here. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So spring is in the air and all that it suggests. Now several statements here refer to the beauty of spring. The winter is past. The word for winter there is used only here in the Old Testament. It refers to the cloudy season of March and April with the latter rains as they call it. Flowers appear in the spring adding delightful colors to the landscape causing the people to sing for joy. Doves coo announcing, so to speak, sp uh, spring's arrival. So that's the flavor that's being painted here in every way, visually and in terms of fragrance and, and, and so forth. Fig trees put forth their early fruit, it says. The early figs were either those that had remained unripened on the trees from the previous summer and then ripened at the beginning of spring, or they were the small edible buds that appeared in March. That term is used for both of them. Grapevines blossom, giving off their fragrance just before the grapes appear. Now, this is kind of an important observation. Most of us, when we read our Bible, haven't done our homework in terms of the agricultural calendar. We need to understand that grapes were, uh, grapevines blossomed in the spring and were harvested in the fall, which means, by the way, there's no such thing as grape juice in Israel in the springtime because they're harvested in the fall. They have no refrigeration normally, obviously. And so when you get to Nisan, Passover, you're talking about wine, and a lot of people make a big thing about that, but you need to understand the agriculture, agricultural calendar, and uh, some of those controversies actually evaporate. Moving on. The elaborate description of spring here was probably meant to do more than simply emphasize the beauty of spring. It is likely also describing their budding relationships, if I can put it that way. In a sense, when one falls in love, it's like spring in everything else, because every, everything seems fresh and new. The world is seen from a different perspective, which is how Solomon felt when he was with his beloved. And I think many of us have remember that so vividly, that when you're in love, everything gleams a little brighter, that colors are a little more intense, 
and, and so forth. Moving on, verse 14. Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. So her lover's pleading continues. She's remaining in her house like a dove or a wood pigeon that typically hides in the cracks between rocky places. And uh, this even may echo these, these uh, cleft in rocks, even echoes in a sense the refuge in Edom, the seek, if you will, that gets into Petra. And we could go on about that, but let's move on here. Countenance is in the plural, by the way, as an amplification. The fullness of her beauty is what's really underscored there. The cleft in the rock. Are you in a cleft in the rock is one of the questions. Remember in 1 Corinthians 10.4, that rock was Christ. Paul makes that idiomatic um, relationship there. And we'll be talking more about that a couple of sessions from now as we get into the allegorical overtones here. Remember the song, Rock of Ages cleft for me, grace hath hide me safe in thee. And uh, we seek that same refuge in a sense. There is a parallel here. So anyway, she goes forward and speaks as they walk. Take us, the, uh, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now what on earth are you talking about with foxes? You and I have no experience with that. That's an idiom very familiar to them. Foxes were noted for their destructive tendencies in crop fields. So her reference here to those animals that prob is probably suggested metaphorically problems in the relationship anticipating problems in a relationship. If you're a, a vineyard, if you have a vineyard, foxes are a source of problems. So the term here dwells, uh, takes advantage of that. The foxes are those little problems that can intrude upon a relationship. And she's uh, uh, making allusion that right here, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. She's not talking about the vineyard, except idiomatically. She's talking about the kinds of problems that come up in a marriage. Foxes are proverbial destroyers in, Nahum, uh, in Nehemiah 4.3, Lamentation 5.18, Ezekiel. Through the scripture, you can corroborate that use of an idiom there. The beloved was asking her lover to take the initiative in solving the problems that were potentially, potentially harmful in their relationship. And how important that is to anticipate those things. Because those little things can become bigger problems if not dealt with properly. The foxes represent obstacles or temptations as have plagued lovers throughout the centuries. Perhaps it is the fox of uncontrolled desire which drives a wedge of guilt between a couple. That's one possibility. Perhaps it's the fox of mistrust and jealousy which breaks down the bond of love. Or it may be the fox of selfishness and pride which refuses to let one acknowledge his own fault to the other. Or it may be the unforgiving spirit that will not accept the apology of the other. These foxes have been ruining vineyards for years, and the end of their work is not in sight. And these was, this was extracted from Glickman's A Song for Lovers. I thought it was well expressed, so we uh, took it as he said it. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes, she says. And here the foxes are little or possibly great enemies which threaten, gnaw, or destroy love before it ripens to full enjoyment. She's suggesting that everything that will challenge the peace of love be rendered harmless or removed early. Catch the little foxes. Very perceptive, very sound. Nail them early. Many people leave some of the thorny problems. Well, we'll, we'll get into that after we're married. Big mistake. The issues, do you want to have kids or not kids? Where are you going to worship? All well, these kinds of things should be resolved early. <laughs> you don't wait until after the marriage. So many people do, it's a big mistake. You want to be careful about what the scripture calls a root of bitterness. That's a phrase you hear a lot of. It comes from Hebrews 12, 15, where the writer says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness. And uh, this is uh, one of the most interesting, the most dangerous hurts or resentments are the most justified ones. 
The ones that aren't substantially justified will take, often take care of themselves, but the ones that are very, you're, where you're justified in having that resentment are the ones that are the most dangerous because they're the ones most likely to keep you in bondage to them. And that's an important insight. The more justified it is, the more important it is to do, forgive that, get it out of your situation so you don't hold yourself in bondage to that resentment. Well, moving on to verse 16, my beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth, or shepherds, if you will, as a verb, among the lilies. And uh, speaking to herself, using personal pronouns, mine, his, and he, in verse 16, is likely that verse 17 that's going to follow is also a soliloquy. He browses or pastures the flock among the lilies. And he's going to, she's going to use that same phrase when we get to chapter 6. She pictures him at work. He has business to attend to, but she is confident of their love remaining true to each other. Commitment is the foundation of a good marriage, not sex or falling in love. Commitment. The key word in the Greek is agape. That's an act of the will, not emotion, the will. And uh, the same thing is true of ahav. The word love here is, is it's a commitment a love, not an emotional reaction kind of love. When we make the vows, God expects us to keep them. Many of, many of us have pledged to till death do his part. Continuing then, until the daybreak and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. The word Bether is the translation of the Hebrew word actually means separation, the mountains of separation. She's freeing him to attend to his work. See, she's dealing with fox number one. She's freeing him to attend to his work. How important that is. In confidence that when it is done, he will give her his undivided attention. So that's the quid pro quo, if you will. And that's fox number two. To give her, when, that's deal, when the work is dealt with, undivided attention. So she's starting to nail off some of these little foxes as you, watch, as you start diagramming what's going on here. Couples in courtship often defer potential problem areas with the attitude that we can work these things out when we're married. Big mistake. Big mistake. This brings unnecessary baggage into the union and will result in tensions. How serious? Who knows? But that's why you want to deal with them up front. The little foxes need to be identified and dealt with. It's simply a question of priorities. Give priorities to those things that will threaten you later. This includes the need for a husband to attend to earning the bread and a future. And uh, Proverbs 24 says that you should build your barn before your house. In other words, deal with your source of income first and then deal with the house. And we, ladies don't like verse 27 of that series too much. The coin can be flipped over too, by the way. There's another side to this issue. The husband also needs to put aside uh, his, his work. He needs to put suitable boundaries, if you will, around the demands of the work or to reserve quality time for the family. And that's especially difficult for people who are self-employed or running their own business because there's never an end to your work. It's also a major threat to those that are in ministry because there's more needs than you can possibly deal with. You need to be diligent in creating the boundaries so that the family doesn't suffer, so the relationship with your spouse does not suffer. In my own case, that's probably one of my biggest guilt. There are very few mistakes I've missed. I've made most of them. But as I look back at my life, my primary regret, we've been married 53 years, but for most of those years, I regarded my family as my support group. I was out wheeling and dealing and building companies and whatever. And my family, I viewed as my report. I didn't abuse them in a direct sense, but I took them for granted. And as I look back at our fi over 50 years of marriage, my main regret is those years where I presumed upon my wife rather than supported her, rather than really invest in the marriage. If our marriage was successful, it was because of her diligence, her initiatives, not mine. And uh, that's, that's probably my primary regret as I look back. See, both need to be dealt with. Both need to be schedule, schedule activities to provide for quality time for the love relationship. Marriage is something you invest in. Something, marriage is something you maintain. This is something, it isn't an event that occurs be, on a day of celebration. No, it's a commitment through life. 
to continue to deal with and invest in. And it goes through phases, and they get richer and richer if done, handled properly. And this is especially difficult for the self-employed, as I mentioned, in those in ministry, because there's, there, the demands have little to do with boundaries. And that goes for the girls, too, by the way, and the housework. That also can never, is never really finished. Among the biggest rivals to the husband are the children. And, and if you think I'm kidding, go home tonight, open the icebox, the refrigerator, and see what's lined up there. You'll find the favorite things of the kids. Do you find the favorite things of the husband? Check it out yourself. Now, part of the solution to all this, of course, is that maybe the tailoring of your career goals. Careers are important, but they can also be gods we worship. We could be careful about that. Tailoring the career goals so they include the family and the marriage. And we deal with some of that in the Vortex Strategy Series if you want to go to some practical applications. Okay, courtship and marriage. We had the first idol in the first session. And uh, we had those first three reflections, you may recall, in the earlier session. We've just gone through the second idol, the springtime visit. And we're now going to move to the second reflection of it, the fifth reflection in total, of uh, dreams of separation. She has a recurring dream that's illuminating here in chapter, opening chapter 3, verse 1. After her lover leaves, she recalls a recurring dream during the winter months when she was separated from him. This is going to deal with the, the pain of separation, his absence, and the uncertainties that get associated with that. She says in verse 1, By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. Now the word night is in the plural, which implies what she's going to be describing here is a recurring dream she has. And uh, nothing is more frightening than to lose the sense of your Lord's presence, both in her sense, but also that sense that we experience. Remember David said, Thou, hast, thou, thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled in Psalm 30. So even David in his relationship uh, had that experience. And uh, sometimes this kind of thing is admonitory. It can maybe love's way of bringing the soul to realization of something cherished or allowed that, that uh, grieves the Holy Spirit of God in, in, a, in a spiritual sense. Or it may be the testing of faith to see whether one can trust in the dark as well as in the light. That's true of a marriage and that's true of our spiritual walk. And uh, sometimes these things are deliberate testings. And uh, as Rutherford said, but flowers need night's cool sweetness, the moonlight and the dew. So Christ from one who loved him, his presence oft withdrew. That may surprise us, but it's a very real thing. Now, <laughs> what do a skydiver and a surfer have in common? There are some invitations you can't postpone. When it's time to move, you need to respond or miss out. And that's going to be uh, the response here. She says, I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the broadways. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. So she's starting to experience that anxiety of his uh, uh, lack of uh, presence. The pain of absence. Is he playing hard to get? Or is he teaching us not to take him for granted? Those are the thoughts running through her mind. The watchmen that go out the city found me, to whom I said, saw ye him whom my soul loveth. The watchmen are the ones guarding the city, and she runs into the, the night police, so to speak, asks for help. Have you seen them? Are they of any help? No. She must find him herself. She no sooner inquires of his whereabouts when she spots him. Just like Jeremiah said, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So that's true of the bridegroom here. It's also true of our bridegroom, and we'll get to that a couple of sessions later when we look more carefully at the allegorical implications of this love poem. She says in verse 4, I was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. See, in her mind, her mother's home was a place of security. So in her dream, when she finally finds him, she gets a grip on him and brings, it, brings him to her place of security. So the dream that began as a nightmare ends happily in the first opportunity of privacy and security. 
Even though it's just a dream, it reflects the long winter of separation. I think that's the role of the, the, this reflection within this opera. You remember, it is an opera. And so this passage ends with the same words that we encountered back in chapter 2, verse 7. It's a refrain that occurs three times in the passage. She says to the general social milieu, the daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Now this may sound strange in the translation, but what she's reading, the key thought here is that arousal should not occur until it can be satisfied. God has such a high view of sex that he does not want it to be cheapened by lust. So you're going to find it very black and white, if you will. In the marriage, it's the highest ecstasy. Outside the marriage, it's sin. It's a very, very crisp boundary that we're dealing with here. So to arouse in the absence of a legitimate opportunity for fulfillment is dangerous because it'll either result in frustration or worse, fornication. The rest of the chapter is of an entirely different character. It sets forth the truth of union rather than the restored communion. So just to reflect on, just to reflect on Reflection 5, Shulamit recounts a recurring dream in which she is separated from Solomon and cannot find him. The long winter of separation in the previous of reflection created a longing giving rise to these dreams. In her dream, she sees herself looking for him but is unable to find him. She begins to walk around the city looking for him. is not able, doesn't get any help. And uh, in the dream, there is no response from the watchman or anybody helping her. Just as she passes them, she finds him. Fortunately, seizing him tightly, refusing to let him go, she hangs on to him until she's brought him into her mother's house, which is her place of security. And that reflection ends with an adjuration to the daughters of Jerusalem. The daughter of Jerusalem are this chorus uh, in the opera that represents the general townsfolk, the, the public, their social mil milieu. And uh, so she has an adju uh, adjuration to the daughters of Jerusalem against the arousal of sexual passion unless it can be satisfied. And obviously it can't be yet because they're not married yet. But this time being in the context of courtship rather than marriage, this was intended to avoid fornication. The previous time being in the context of marriage, it meant to avoid frustration. So while the marriage bond, uh, in, within the marriage bond, sexual passion must not be aroused unless it can also be satisfied, lest it lead to frustration. Outside the marriage bond, it can lead to fornication. Any kind of activity that tends to arouse the passions must be avoided by the courting couple because it's, it's dangerous territory until the marriage takes place. Sex is a beautiful thing and the wedding should mark the climax of the courtship and the commencement of sexual life together. Foreplay in the form of petting must not be practiced because this leads to sexual arousal that cannot at this time be satisfied. So in that sense, petting is dangerous. So, the first idol we've had, the second idol we've just gone through. Now we hit the third idol, and this is the big one. This is the marital union, the reflections on the marital union. It consists of the wedding procession, the sixth reflection, and the wedding night itself, the seventh reflection. In chapter 4, it uh, deals with that. So let's move on to the third idol, opening up with the sixth verse of chapter 3. You need to understand there are five steps, typically, in the ancient Jewish marriage. The betrothal, the time when the marriage arrangement for the marriage was contracted. The wedding procession was accomplished when the groom went... See, the groom would go away to build a house, typically an extension of his father's house. And um, when it was accomplished, he would, come, he would either come back to the house of the bride to fetch her, or he would send a wedding party to fetch her to his home, and he would go out to meet her. Then, of course, was the wedding ceremony where the two are recognized to be husband and wife in a legal sense. And then the wedding feast or banquet, sometimes lasting a whole week, by the way. And that would follow the ceremony. The first night of that was the wedding night where the married couple became one in the flesh through their first sexual union. And uh, so the wedding procession is the next step. Solomon sends a wedding party from Jerusalem to, uh, to Galilee to fetch the Shulamite for the wedding ceremony in Jerusalem. We're going to see the party returning towards Jerusalem with the bride in their midst. Verse 6. 
Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the powders of the merchant? All through this opera, spices and fragrance are used for the atmosphere to, to, uh, to celebrate. And he's all, when we see a, uh, a, uh, a movie, we're often not conscious of the music, which is so critical in setting the right mood the, of what's going on, whether it's a, a tension or whether it's a whatever. Uh, we, 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 we use music a great deal in our entertainments. In this opera, we're going to constantly see the use of spices of different kinds to raise the atmosphere, if you will. So we have perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and all the powders of merchant. Now, myrrh was an ingredient in the holy oil in Exodus 30. Frankincense was also an ingredient of the holy incense. These both were used by the priesthood, uh, and the fragrance was very pungent in, in terms of uh, their activities. Royal honors are here being accorded in with a lavish expenditure. These spices were expensive. They constitute a primary part of their um, um, merchandise and so forth. So the expenditure of spices making smoke and fragrance here. The royal accoutrements are recognized. She has been treated like a queen as the whole flavor here. Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it and of the valiant of Israel. The bed here... It's a mita, it's a travel couch, or what we might consider the royal litter, if you will. There were 60 men, and these weren't just perfunctories, these were warriors there to protect the, the royal palace guard. Not just window dressing, they're capable warriors, as you'll see here in the next verse. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. So they're there to provide protection, and they're serious about it. And that, in 1 Maccabees 9, we find a similar allusion here. Moving on. King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon, it says in verse 9. Now, the chariot here, or it's the bed of state, um, it's a bed with a canopy over it, probably of Egyptian design, uh, the wedding bed, if you will, made of cedar in accordance with the decor of the bridal chamber. And uh, he made pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, wow, the covering of it, purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for or by the daughters of Jerusalem. Cushion of purple adorned with tapestry procured by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold the king Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals and in the day of the gladness of his heart. This is not his royal crown. This is a crown that's presented to him by his mother. This Bathsheba de developed this for him. It's an atara. It's not the diadem or Stephanos. It's a atara, the crown a, a wreath, if you will. Um, it's a wedding crown. This was a custom of ancient Israel, and this was one. This one was made by his mother Bathsheba. But something very interesting you want to pick up on here: this practice of a crown in a marriage was discontinued. Once the, after, after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is a major milestone in the whole history of the nation of Israel. And so today, what they do in a Jewish wedding is they break a wine glass, and that is a part of a Jewish wedding ceremony today. And what most people don't, may not know, that's intended to symbolize the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And uh, even on the occasion of a Jew's happiest day, the day of his wedding, Jerusalem must be remembered. That's the flavor. And uh, many people, are, if you've been, or been at or witnessed a Jewish wedding, you know about the bringing of the glass. Many people may not know why do they do that. That's the reason. At this point, the wedding ceremony occurs. The wedding banquet was reflected back in uh, chapter 1, you may recall. The following reflection describes, though, again, in vastly more detail, the wedding night itself. For many people, this is the peak of the entire opera, the peak of the, the program here. The earlier reflection, that was the third reflection of the wedding night, was from the Shulamite. This, which is the seventh reflection, is from the groom's point of view. 
And except for one verse, it is he that's doing all the speaking. And so we're moving into the seventh reflection, the wedding night, chapter 4, verse 1. He begins with a sevenfold praise of her beauty. And I might pause right here to remind you. This passage, the whole book, but certainly this passage, is one of the most uncomfortable one for many, especially pastors trying to teach this from a pulpit. This is one of the reasons that the rabbis didn't let someone read the book, the Song of Songs, unless he was over 30. It is candidly, you cannot escape the fact it is very sensual, it is very graphic, it is very direct in its way. And uh, just be prepared for that. Uh, we might say this is going to be rated X, if you will. But moving on. Verse 1, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as the flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Now, right away, we begin to realize the idioms that they're using are foreign to our culture and our ears. They're in an agriculture and agrarian economy. Um, they are, uh, their lives were continually confronted with the husbandry issues of different uh, animals and so forth. So their, their idioms of comparison are strange to our ears. Thou hast dove's eyes. I don't think you're going to go home and tell your wife she's got eyes like a dove. She won't know what you're talking about. And uh, uh, hair like a flock of goats, that, that, sounds, that does not sound appealing to us. It was to them. And so we want to get into this here. Four times he's going to declare her fair, that she's very fair, meaning she's without spot. That, by the way, is one of the key messages throughout this whole opera, is that he views her as absolutely perfect, that without spot, without blemish. And uh, so, he, and he says, within thy locks, see, behind the veil is what it really means. It was customary for a bride to be veiled on the wedding night. And that's one of the reasons that prostitutes were veiled when they, did, when they applied their craft, as you may have noticed from some of the Bible stories. The goats in Israel. Syrian goats were mostly black with silken hair. Very attractive hair, strangely enough. On a steep slope, giving the appearance of hanging down on the sides of the cliff is the, is the, is the flavor here. As a, your hair is like a flock of goats. We would find that offensive. It's used in a context of a compliment. And he, he's starting working her from top down. Seven statements he's going to make about her, each one in the superlative. And this one's like a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. That's a positive thing in this culture. The slopes of Mount Gilead rising from the Jordan Valley are very bare with a brown, uh, bronze collar. And in that same sense, hair is a woman's glory, we're told in the New Testament. Thy hair is a flock of goats. Hair speaks of two things. It speaks of consecration and it speaks of submission. The Nazarites were not to cut their hair as a sign of their commitment, number six. Remember Samson, same thing. That's why his hair is so important in the career of Samson, because he was a Nazarite. That was a symbol of his commitment. And Paul alluded to the long hair of women as her glory in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn. Well, most of us are not familiar with the clean whiteness of a freshly shorn sheep. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. So her teeth are matched pair, like a <laughs> matched pearls or something. Sheep washed shorn and white, matched, none missing. A set of pearls half hidden in the mouth is the way he's describing her teeth. These are not idioms that we would probably pick up to emulate in our culture, because we're in a different culture. But in their culture, this is the way, this is the most extreme way he could find to communicate these things. And by the way, teeth also speak of our ability to assimilate the truth. And that you start building, you start getting into allegorical issues here then. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. This thread of scarlet should echo Rahab's salvation in the Battle of Jericho. It also should echo, it will echo, the scarlet thread from Genesis chapter 3, God's commitment to a Redeemer, all the way to seeing his vesture and blood in Revelation 19. 
We're going to deal with the, some of the allegorical issues separately so we don't break the stride, the, the emotional and, 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 and the, the portrayal of what we have here in Chapter 4 especially. Uh, so we're going to deal with that in a subsequent session and get back, we'll re double back on some of these allegorical issues and there will be some surprises in that, I believe. And uh, the pomegranate. We don't probably traffic in pomegranates that much. Their redness is uh, tempered with a ruby color. They're mentioned over 30 times in the Bible, used as an indication of rank in the hem of a garment in Exodus 28 and 29. The Levites, you see, in, in their culture, the hem of your garment is where you embroidered your, your rank in the society, your genealogy, your, your role. We, we think of stripes on a sleeve of an airline captain or something. They had their, that all emblazoned on the hem of the garment. And we find pomegranates are an indication of rank on the hem of a garment. They were also emblazoned on the temple. 1 Kings 7, 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 52. You find these echoes of the pomegranate, a highly venerated symbol. Uh, and uh, is there a temple pun here? We'll talk about that when we get to the allegories. But um, pomegranate has a circular calyx at the end that looks sort of like a little crown. And a tradition claims that Solomon used it as a model for the one he wore. That's, that's the tradition we have. The leaves are shiny, dark green. Flowers are coral and waxy. The fruits make a syrup called grenadine. Moving on. Thy neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory, whereupon they hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Now, <laughs> this isn't the kind of compliment you might give your wife, but here it was intended to be, having a long neck adorned with ornaments. Shields were often hung on tower walls. And uh, we, from here you can springboard into allegories too with the armor of God and so forth. But moving on here. Solomon made 200 golden targets and 300 golden shields. And they were put in the house of the forest of Lebanon. 1 Kings 10. And they served, that served as the royal armory. And it may have been known as the Tower of David. So that may tie to this verse if you will. These shields were later carried away by Pharaoh Shishak at the time of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who then replaced him with brass shields for his bodyguard to use. So these were idioms familiar in the, in, back in that day and complementary, although they would sound strange to us, of course. Then he continues, Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Soft, attracting, stroking. Having described the sevenfold beauty of his bride from top down, eyes, hair, teeth, mouth, temples, neck, breasts, he anticipates their first intercourse. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. This is what in other literature would be called the Mount of Venus. He's approaching the pubic area, if you will. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. He is totally satisfied with his bride. And this is the key message throughout the book. One of the primary purposes of this book is to show you how our shepherd king sees you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinir and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards, from the peak of whatever, in other words. Travel to travel to ecstatic heights. He's also the God of the second chance, by the way. The first time he said, come, let's go up to the mountains, she put him off and lost the moment. But he comes back and says, let's go for it. And they do. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister bride. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. Strange words, sister bride, or spouse. It's, it's bride for the first time in that, uh, in that nomenclature here. The Hebrew word comes from a root which means to pierce through and carries the meaning of that which is brought to completion. Putting the two concepts together, the Hebrew word used for bride refers to one who has reached the goal of her womanly calling, that of becoming a sexual partner to her husband, thus perfectly comp completing herself and him. This is the redoing, really, of the creation of Eve. Eve was taken from the side of Adam. Adam was split in two, in effect. 
the male and the female, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. And this is the, the uh, reunion of that, in a sense. That's what, that was God's design. And because it's God's design is one reason he treats it so majestically and so strictly, because that reunion, that union is holy. It says, how fair is my love, my sister bride. How much better is thy love than wine, the smell of thine ointments than all spices. The word here, of course, is dod, the sexual love. The foreplay begins. Previously, he used the word yafu for beautiful, referring to visual impression, beautiful in the visual sense. Here, the word better is actually a different word, tovu, which he describes his physical experience with her. Not visually, he is experiencing her. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as honeycomb. Honey and milk are under my tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Now, the word Lebanon means something different today. I'll come back to the description is based on experience, not on sight alone, in other words. Previously, her lips were described by their color in accordance with how they appeared to his sight. Now, however, he is describing them according to his physical experience with them. The senses of taste and smell are intricately involved, not just visual here. Okay. And uh, Lebanon is going to come up again, so I'll leave that for now. A garden enclosed is my, my sister, my spouse. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. He's describing the female gentles in terms of a garden that's not unusual in literature of the ancient world. Sealed, locked, access only to the rightful owner, in other words, a virgin. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, campfire and spikenard. This is all for arousal. The word orchard I'm going to talk more about when we get to allegories, but the, uh, the orchard of pomegranates, the word is pardis. It, it's a foreign word, Persian actually, for the word paradise. Spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes of all chief spices. Their vocabulary of exaltation here is in the spice realm, obviously. Saffron was obtained from the crocus in Israel and used as an ornament. Calamus was a plant with a reed-like stem and tawny color imported from India. Cinnamon came from the East Indies and aloes from India. And uh, the spikenard we talked about before came from the Himalayas. Very expensive stuff. A fountain of garden, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. Feel the flowing going here. Sprouting from within. Thus shall I up to now has been a virgin. It is her that Solomon now passionately desires, and only by her will he be satisfied. He describes the lubrication process which will allow for the satisfaction of what he now desires. That's what's going on here. At this point, the bride speaks. Up till now, it's been him. At this point, she speaks. Awake, O north wind, and come thou, come thou south. Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Wow. North and south winds don't mean much to us because we are not probably that sensitive to uh, in an agricultural environment. The west wind brings rain. The east wind brings hot. It's hot and withering. The north wind clears the air with cool breezes. And the south wind brings the warmness that causes things to grow. So the north and south are favorable each in their way. The north-south winds promote growth if they come and in, in, in interchange at the proper times. As a result, the entire garden becomes a sea of incense and fragrance, blowing out its odor with fragrant plants. The north wind may be blowing to teach us to walk by faith and not by feeling, to demonstrate our love for him through diligence, not tingly feelings or the like. Feelings are fickle. They are affected by what you ate, by what someone said this morning, by media, the weather, current news. Not so with faith. It is totally independent on the circumstances. And that's a parallel we'll talk about in, in, a, in a later session. So we get to the climactic verse, the first verse of chapter 5. I am come into my garden, my sister bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my, with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. 
By the way, the spice that he's referring to is the balsam that was brought to Solomon in abundance by the Queen of Sheba in that visit in 1 Kings 10. All of these phrases simply point to the pinnacle of full enjoyment and satisfaction. This pronounces sanction on the wedding union and encourages them, now that they are husband and wife, to be drunk with sexual pleasure. That's the calling. That's the command. And uh, we have this strange phrase added here. Eat, O friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. That's neither one of them, really. Many uh, commentators presume that's a refrain from the daughters of Jerusalem in this opera. Very, very reasonable uh, presumption. There's another possibility that some of them is, have suggested. This may be the words of God himself. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly. It's intended clearly to be a sanctioning blessing on the whole process. And where it comes from, whether it's echoed by the daughters of Jerusalem or whether it's intended to be God himself in some special way is a form of conjecture. It's clearly the centerpiece of the entire opera. From chapter 1, verse 2 to 4.15, we have the prelude from chapter, the second verse of chapter 5 to the end. Right in the middle of this, we have clearly, physically, literally, the centerpiece of the entire opera. There are 111 lines prior to this. There's 111 lines subsequent to this. And so it is, the point I like to highlight here is that it's a deliberate design. When you encounter something like that, it gets your attention and causes you to treat all the other pieces with respect because they're there just as deliberately. And so I want to remind you of Hebrews 13.4. Let's go to the New Testament and get a corroboration here. The writer of the Hebrews says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. And this is a key point for those that might have hesitancy in enjoying sex in marriage. Many people in marriage, Christians especially, may be hesitant because in our culture, we have made sex a dirty word. Outside the marriage, it is abused every possible way by our entertainment industry, by our cultural idioms, what have you. No, this is a key point. The bed undefiled. The word bed here in the Greek is koite, koitus. It's referring to sexual intercourse. It's undefiled in marriage. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Ooh. Understand it's black and white. There's no gray area. There's a sharp line here. In marriage, great. Peak. Fabulous. Outside, serious stuff. The two previous applications of, of the reflections are emphasized here. The importance of verbalizing to your mate what you're about, uh, 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 what you like about your mate. Do you do that every day? You told your, how, how long has it been since you told your wife you loved her? Or even better, have highlighted something very special that's true, that's sincere, and yet positive. The frequency with which this has been emphasized here in the opera shows the importance of this aspect to the marriage relationship. Don't take that for granted. Most guys do. Gee, I told her I loved her when we got married. Oh, wait a minute. That's something you should be doing every day. Find a way to do that every day. A second application repeated is the importance of learning proper foreplay for the purpose of arousing passions for the total enjoyment of the second act. Never should be routine. It should be an event with skill and attention and deliber deliberation. The third application focuses on the importance of virginity. Shulamit entered the marriage as a virgin totally reserved for her mate. We live in a day where loose morality and the existence of virgins at the time of marriage is becoming more and more Rare, tragically. Many single Christians today have already lost their virginity before accepting Christ. And this is one area that you can't rectify exactly. But at the same time, if one finds himself or herself in this position, it's necessary to remember that the believer is now a new creature in Christ. And all sins have been forgiven. Let's not lose sight of that. That's the reality. That's, the That's why it's called the good news. Once one has been purified by Christ and is now to act as if one is still a virgin and reserved totally for the future mate. There's no reason you can't do that. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's effectually the same thing because Christ 
took care of that on that cross. It's impossible to become a virgin again, of course, but one can become as one from this point on and enter into all the joys of sexual union at marriage. That's available. Well, a fourth application comes from her recognition that she had been, that he, uh, what had been her garden was now his. We use the garden idiom for that from his point of view. Her body, especially sexually, was now his, and his was now hers. That exchange is crucial, and it's biblical. That's the same point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 7, first five verses. Check it out. The lesson is that one mate has the obligation sec of sexually satisfying the other mate because the ownership of the body has been transferred to the other at marriage. You are no longer your own. You are each the others. And that's real. That's serious. That should be recognized. Withholding sexual satisfaction from a mate is forbidden in the scripture. So, okay, we've just been through part one of a two-part book. Part two of the book is going to discuss two areas of adjustment. The first is the area of sexual problems that arise in the marriage, and this is going to be the issue in what we call the fourth idol. And the second area of adjustment concerns experimentation with new types and new acts of sexual activity in the marriage, and this is the concern of the fifth and final idol. So that's forthcoming. So we've been through the first three idols of five, 13 reflections, but organized as five idols. We've been through three of them. Next time, we're going to take on the fourth and fifth idol. And uh, that's a total of six different uh, reflections, um, from seven all the way to 13. Is that right? So, yeah. And uh, so for next time, you've got an ambitious amount of reading to do for our next session. I want you to study the rest of the book. Chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. Next time. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer.